Good morning once again, and uh, thanks for joining us on The Breakfast. It's now time for Off the Press, where we go through the major stories making headlines across Nigeria today. Starting with stories on the Daily Sun. It should be on your screen in just a few seconds. It says there, federal government begins payment of benefits to diseased doctors and others. Security stalls Igboho's court appearance in Kotonou. Extradition hearing holds today as agents grill pro Yoruba nation agitator and wife. Also, Buhari's failure um, is a cause of his agitation, says Afenifere. NNPC spends 274 billion naira on petrol subsidy in five months. And also, death toll in terror attacks rises to 3,100 in three months. Binwe, Zamfara, Bernou, Kaduna top chart. Time for political leaders to partner church on insecurity, says Pastor Kumui. Um, one or two others uh, I mean, Enugu, gunmen killed three policemen and civilian in Enugu checkpoint attacks. Um, I think that's uh, we, all we will quickly share. Well, uh, Anambra Gubernatera Ohaneza never endorsed any candidate, says the president. On the Punch newspaper, COVID 19 testing stops in 13 states, Delta variants hitting unvaccinated Nigerians. Also about COVID-19, that virus wiped off of five billion dollars diaspora remittances, says federal government. The federal government tells court we've not stopped Nigerians from using Twitter. Cooking gas price soars to 500 naira per kg. Retailers consumers lament, and uh, don't assent PIB. Fresh hostilities loom in Niger Delta, says Dixon. Baptist contracts. Uh, contacts chapters over ransom for Kaduna Bethel students. Ten Ogun communities threaten LG pole boycott over road destroyed by dredgers. 68-year-old lecturer, man, 60, arraigned for alleged defilement of underage girls. After six hours hearing, Benin Court releases Igboho's wife. Benin Court releases Igboho's wife, remains activist. Uh, those are the ones we're taking on the Punch newspaper. And now moving on to the nation newspapers. Igboho appears in court for immigration-related offences. Um, also, agitator expo expected back in Cotonou court. Wife's German passport released. Autumn opposes bill to gag media. And also banditry worrisome, says Buhari. Gunmen in police uniform kill five cops at checkpoint. Uh, also on the nation this morning. Uh, uh, council poll, Lagos government restricts movement. Only 1.7% of 3.7 billion vaccines administered in Africa. And 40 refinery licenses not in use. That's also on the nation newspapers this morning. Uh, I think I can squeeze in one in. Military won't condone violent secession agitation. CDS warns. Those are the big ones on the nation. Let's quickly look at the Daily Trust. Uh, cholera here is making the headlines. Uh, cholera kills 325, afflicts 14,343 in six months. And the death toll rises as outbreak spreads to more states. APC says we won't impose presidential candidates for 2023. Military says it's not our duty to stop agitations. And uh, we'll also see this one saying federal government fails to file extradition charges as Benin court remands Igboho. Let's say good morning to our guests, Chief Lecturer, Nigerian Institute of Journalism, Mr. Jide Johnson. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, and it's a pleasure to be, <clears throat> to be with you. Thank God. It's Friday. Um, once again, <laughs> yeah, we bless the name of the Lord for keeping us to this day. And then um, it's Friday, like you said. Thank God it's Friday. Let's start with the issue of Igbo and where we see um, where a nation, someone was arrested on immigration charges based on what was presented before the court and he has appeared before the court. The judicial process is taking place. Rule of law is in place and we are seeing exchanges and we have seen that the wife has been released um, from by, by the courts and his passport has been released back to her. Um, bring that Let's play that scenario in Nigeria. Let's look at the El Zazaki issue in, in Kaduna. His wife and himself still in custody to date. We don't know when the next court appearances uh, will be. And um, situate that with Nam Descano, we don't even know the facts of the case. Like I said, 
last week until we get to the court. When we get to the court, the issue is no longer in the hand of the government. It's now left for the judicial processes, and the judicial process will take it. Due course, it's left, the burden of proof lies with the prosecution, which happens to be the government, against whoever is the accused. And that tells you that the state of rule of law in Nigeria and the state of rule of law in the Republic of Benin it's about, it's about, it's about, it's about process. If someone is a judge not guilty or can be spoken by law of competent jurisdiction, and that's how a normal society, that's how a democratic society, that's how a sovereign nation, and a nation that operates within the ambit of the rule of law and fundamental human rights of the citizenry, that's the way it is. When people talk about the rule of law, there are three fundamental principles that govern the rule of law. And just for us to just explain, so that some of our viewers, it's about the supremacy of the Constitution. That the Constitution is the supreme organ in any given state. It talks about the fundamental human right of, 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 of people and then equality before the law. Everybody being treated as, as equal. There's nobody that is above, above the law. So these are the tenets of a principle of democracy, a principle of rule of law as advocated by Professor Ibita Isi. So once those are not in place, you can't call yourself to be a democratic, a democratic society. You can't call yourself to be a viral, um, egalitarian uh, society whereby people have respect for rule of law. Um, hopefully, the courts will, will rule, will restitute what happened with Sunday Bo and with what happened um, with um, Nam Bekali. You see that they are contra, they are pose, they are pose, they are pose apart. Let's wait as this begins to, to unfold and then we can draw good comparison and we can take some lessons that we can learn from it in about how to go about effecting arrest and, mm. and, and enforcing our laws within our country and even outside the borders of our country and by following the process and common commonsensical approach to getting to getting things to getting things done. If you read really that story to what the chief uh, the chief of defense staff said that it's not the responsibility of the military, which is based on the story you read in the Daily Trust. Yes, to it's stop agitations. Is to, to stop agitation. Agitation is a key component part of democratic society. That it's, it's, look, the right of freedom of association and freedom of expression, freedom of expression and freedom of association has given me the right to protest. If I don't feel, if I feel aggrieved about anything, I can go to the floor of the National Assembly, I can go to the front of... People protest in front of White House. People protest in front of the Congress in United States of America. We even saw someone that was aggrieved, that slapped... He took it to the extreme, that slapped the French president. He was not shot at... In actual sense, the president sent for him and asked him, why did you slap me in the first instance? And the guy told him, it was not premeditated. As, I was, as you are just approaching me, I felt aggrieved about your policies and program. And, that's, and the court process took its due course. The guy was prosecuted through the court. The president of France did not intervene. The state security did not intervene. He was prosecuted and he was sent to, 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 to jail to face the consequences of his action, his act of aggression and criminality. So agitation does not support criminality. It does not support aggression. But everyone, for a democratic society to be violent, Everyone must have a right to have his say. And that's the beauty of democracy. Now, let's relate that story with another story uh, with NNPC. NNPC saying that the, the subsidized petroleum product with over 245 billion in six months. Who are they deceiving? Are they deceiving themselves or they are deceiving us? We've been told over and over time, all we just need to do is to do content analysis of this newspaper report in the last 20 years and look at the issue of petroleum subsidy, and then we know who is deceiving who. That they subsidize petroleum product for 245 billion in six months. And then there's another story in Daily Trust that for 40 refineries are not, licenses have been granted for people to start refinery, and 40 licenses have been granted. And, hmm, Licenses are granted. Out of those licenses granted, 40 are not in use. One, two, three to 40 are not in use. And what are they doing? So we will know that there's a systematic attempt to prevent refineries from running in Nigeria so that people that claim to be spending for subsidy of petroleum product in Nigeria will continue to cash out and cash in on Nigerians because all of us have gone asleep and they are the ones that are awake, like a typical popular song 
in Nigeria and to so logo and to do logo pe. So they are taking advantage of Nigerians out of our sheer ignorance. Who is subsidizing? We let that story to the price of uh, of cooking gas. You said the price of cooking gas has gone up to five hundred naira per kg. So where is the subsidy? I'm asking where is the subsidy? Okay, right. Mr. Jide Johnson, let's go to the Punch newspaper. There's a story here on the Punch that says, uh, that reads, we've not stopped Nigerians from using Twitter, federal government tells court. Now, this was because a lawyer, um, Inibe F. Young, you know, took this matter to court saying it was a breach of human rights for the federal government to stop Nigerians from expressing their freedom um, you know, on social media. But um, the Attorney General of the Federation, Abubakar Malami, went on to sign an affidavit to say that they had not stopped Nigerians from using social media and that, in fact, many Nigerians are still using it. How then do you tie this to earlier statement by the federal government on June 4th, 2021, that social media, especially Twitter, actually had been suspended and, you know, threats by the Attorney General of the Federation that people who are still using social media will be prosecuted and that they will know their offense when they're charged to court? You see, you test the decisions and actions of government under the constitutionality of the law of your federation. Until we test it by that, we will not straighten this democracy. I want to appreciate that lawyer that approached. Some of us have advocated that government does not have the right, that it is not within the ambit of any section 22 of 1999 constitution as amended, and section 36 of 1999 constitution as amended, provided for you to use any platform to give expression to your thoughts. And the, under the comp, under, even under the fundamental human rights, the freedom of expression of your thought is that. So until the actions of government are challenged by court, and that's why we are missing the likes of Ghanifa and me in this present democratic experience. You think that you have gotten, and I hope that space is being filled by this by this young lawyer that is taking government to court concerning even on the issue of electronic voting. You remember I said it that if you take it to court, the federal government, the government will lose because there's no law you can make that is not court. any law that you make, any bill that you pass that is inconsistent with the constitution will be rendered null and void. So we need to approach the court. You could see that government knew the attorney general knew that it was an illegal pronouncement, and the fact that the pronouncement is made by a minister, or that the fact that the pronouncement is made by a minister or the attorney, that's not law. We are not a monarchical government, whether you rule by proclamation of the king or the queen. So because the king said so, it becomes that. Or we are not an authoritarian society, whereby because people are occupying about certain positions of authority, their, their pronouncement becomes law. No, it's not, it, doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Until we begin to challenge their actions in court, just like this young man is doing, we will not strengthen our democracy. And I think that we have seen that if the Attorney General could depose and have that in court and say that federal government did not. Because where is the instrument? Let's put it in perspective. Where is the instrument that the federal government used to ban Twitter? Where is the instrument? I personally gave myself, my students, some, a question and I asked them to write their Twitter handle and all their social media handle. And I went into the hall and they said, you know what? Federal government has banned Twitter. I said, we are training you to be journalists. Tell me the instrument. Yeah, I deliberately put it in the question to test your intelligence and your knowledge. Now, tell me the instrument that the federal government has used to ban Twitter, other than the pronouncement. And as a journalist, you take a pronouncement of someone in authority and you take it over. Then you are not supposed to be a journalist. You are not fit to be a custodian, to be the watchdog. You are not fit under the 1999 Constitution to hold government accountable because that's the second part of Section 22. He said you should hold government accountable. You are given the right to be the watchdog and the fourth estate of the land. So beyond the lawyers are going to the court, we as journalists also ought to the society to give them a truthful account of what happens in this. That's our, that's, that's our okay. client, because that's the huge responsibility that is placed, that is placed on us. And that's why I left you. The ten of good community. Let me just tie this up. The ten of good community that said they are not voting in the council poll because their roads are bad. I think we should take it forward. When elections are coming, people should boycott the election and tell government until you do certain things in our area. We are not. Just imagine if it's a gubernatorial election and more than two thirds of the communities that don't have roads, that don't have anything, say they are not voting. That means that there can't be an election. They are all, no, but no winner will be declared until we take the bull by the hand. Responsibility. Right. Taking our best in our hand, we won't have democracy. All right, quickly also share your thoughts on the story on the Daily Sun. It says death toll in terror attacks 
rises to 3,100 in three months. Um, and of course, uh, I want you to put that side by side with the announcement. It's not in the news this morning, but the announcement of Nigeria receiving its uh, six uh, Super Tucano jets. Um, you know, this is, you know, seemingly our report card with regards to our, you know, fights against terror and the ability to protect Nigerian lives. 3,100 in three months doesn't look good. Even one life, even one life lost. Okay. Just one life lost. Do you know what, if an American is taking us an hostage in Nigeria, do you know what America would deploy? That's the, that's the major reason. Why. What's the value of a Nigerian life? What's the value of what value does government place on my life, on your life? Look at the state of our infrastructure. If you drive across the length and breadth of Nigeria, it's a dead trap waiting to happen. We are just looking at those ones on terror attack. Just because of the state of the road, you look at people that die by accident. Enough alone in Nigeria, you'll be shocked at the numbers. So essentially, government don't really care about us because if they to come, it's not about putting, it's not about buying. Um, those um, those arms and ammunition. It's also about putting putting a structure and a system in place, a system to fight terrorism. But when you have a system that rewards criminality, when you have a system that pays in service, calling terrorists bandits, calling terrorists insurgents, it's about change, changing the narrative. It's about still giving those people the ability to move globally. Because the moment you declare a group as terrorist group, they have entered a no-fly zone. They are, they, are, they, are, they are citizens of no nation. They are nationless. And that's the lip service federal government is paying. How would you lose 3,000 people to terrorist attack in your country? The government has failed in its responsibility, its major responsibility to protect the lives and property of its citizenry, to protect the territorial integrity the territorial integrity of its country. Do we even have territorial integrity? We have a situation where the flag of ISWA was placed in Niger. We have a situation in 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 in, in, in the northeast in Bonu and Yobe. We have situations in the north in the north in the north in the northwest in Zamfara in Zamfara state where people have, have sent people away from their from their ancient home because. They are exploring our solid minerals. Look, the bottom line is very simple. Until we value what is a Nigerian life, then there's no basis for a nation. Because what defines a nation is its people. And what defines the constitution of a nation is the people. That's why the constitution, the opening statement of Nigeria in 1999, we the people of Nigeria, we the people. So anything that affects the people affects the nation. But the question I ask is that, what value do we play on the people of Nigeria? Our health sector, our educational sector, our infrastructure, our lives, even people that we elect in office, if they are going out now, they will decide to push us out of the road. If it rains now, everywhere is flooded. There are potholes left, right, and center. If they want to construct roads, you know, I traveled outside of Lagos, I returned here on, 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 on Monday, and then I spent one hour between the long, no, two hours between the long bridge in Bega to, before Bega to Bega, two hours, just because they are constructing routes. Federal government of Nigeria and the state government wasted two hours of my life. That's, you know, our life is measured in terms of time. Two hours have been taken away from my life. Because when the time comes, I will die. Because we, our life is measured in time, in terms of seconds, minutes, hours. Uh, this that's how our life is measured and anyone that takes your time and that wastes your time is wasting your life and that's how federal government and state government through the foolish infrastructure programs they say they do waste nigerian lives do you know what i mean if someone if you are taking someone to the hospital do you know how many people have died because they are constructing routes and they didn't provide the alternative that have died inside traffic and we just take it as normal so those three thousand lives is just is just um, a, 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 a a sample of the entire population of Nigerians that have died out of carelessness and failure of government to do its responsibility based on its constitutional provision that it will protect our lives and property. All right, Mr. Jide Johnson, I will thank you very much, but we have to wrap it here. Chief Lecturer, Nigerian Institute of Journalism, NIJ, thank you very much and have a great weekend. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you.
All right. We will now go back in time. I'm going back to the year 1968 to tell you about a hijacking. Do stay with us.